We saw during the summer the possibility of even overwhelmingly peaceful crowds being overrun by uh, a few thugs. Uh, what I've done is called uh, Jay Nixon, uh, the governor of Missouri, uh, to make sure that he has a plan to respond in a careful uh, and appropriate uh, way to any potential violence, um, to be able to sort out the vast majority of peaceful protesters from uh, the handful who are not. Yeah, by the way, you put on, the cops put on their magic glasses and they uh, sort out, as he said, the few thugs, uh, or as, uh, as uh, <laughs> um, the uh, man who uh, CNN features so prominently uh, says all the time, a few knuckleheads. He calls arsonists and, you know, and, and, and people who set fires and loot. They're, knuck they're knuckleheads. All right, Naomi Schaefer Riley wrote all about this at the New York Post. CNN is lying when they say Ferguson protests were peaceful. Let me read, read to you what she wrote here. The network helps stir up a nation to the point of violence, yet since the protesters must always be on the side of the angels, CNN lies about the destruction that follows. And Basically, she says, if you wanted to know the truth about what was going on in Ferguson what, during the riots, you had to turn the sound off. Uh, Naomi, great column. And um, boy, oh boy, this whole story could not have gotten to where it is and not be continuing as it is without the likes of CNN pushing it be, and, and being behind it, in effect. Right. Well, this is what it means to have a media narrative. I mean, they've already sort of figured out the beginning, middle, and the end of the story before it's actually happened. And I think you saw this, you know, even before the verdict was actually handed down. There are all these people gathered, and already you had Van Jones and other people saying, oh, you know, most of the people here are here to peacefully protest. And it's, as you said, it's just going to be a few knuckleheads who are going to do something wrong. And then, you know, they made sure that that was the narrative that followed. So while their cameramen were trained on people who were taking baseball bats to windows and and you know bringing bottles of liquor out of stores that they had looted, the the correspondents uh, and the anchors were sitting there telling a different story. Yeah, and, and, and you know I, he has rubbed me the wrong way for years. But when he started calling them knuckleheads, it's right out of it's right out of the Obama. I'm surprised Obama didn't in that cut didn't say to Stephanopoulos knuckleheads because I've heard him refer to troublemakers as knuckleheads. So it, it's the same same you know. Maybe they all got it from Saul Alinsky's book. I don't know. But, you know, <laughs> interesting, the day after the riots, the latest riots, which I guess if the verdict was announced Monday, uh, then this, was, uh, this would be on Tuesday morning, um, Don Lemon actually went at it with Van Jones, to his credit, and said it was not a few people. It was a lot of people. It was the majority of people. You and I were both here. He said, what, are you, what did you see? What are you talking about? And they went at it pretty vehemently. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, Don Lemon, to his credit, has been, I think he's been trying at least, you know, but you had this ridiculous exchange at one point where Jason Carroll was actually being almost attacked by some of these protesters. They were yelling at him and getting in his face, and Don Lemon actually went to another shot and said, we're worried about Jason Carroll's safety. Then he goes back to Jason Carroll, and he said, what happened? And here is his own correspondent stonewalling him. Jason Carroll tells Don Lemon he doesn't want to tell <laughs> Don Lemon what the protesters, quote unquote, were saying because, you know, they weren't representative of the peaceful protesters there. You know, since when, when you're doing man on the street interviews, does each individual have to be representative of the whole, first of all? And second of all, who's to say they weren't representative since they couldn't find any peaceful protesters to actually interview? Absolutely. And then, you know, then there's the legal narrative, the people in the studio, the people talking about the grand jury. They're just as bad because they're, they're, they're rousing up this, uh, hey, the grand jury was unfair. I heard it on CNN, whether it's Sonny Houston or one of the others, not, not Mark O'Mara, not Paul Callan. They're right on. Uh, but for the most part, I've heard we need another grand jury. This was unfair. You can't believe the cop's testimony. It doesn't make sense. I mean, right on down the line, they're continuing. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you 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 know, they bring in the experts that they want, um, but you know, they're 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 going after the prosecutor, you know, for they're going after the prosecutor for handing the grand jury too much evidence, as far as I can figure. Yeah. But of course, if they didn't, if he didn't, if he had handpicked it in some way, or if he had decided, which was probably what he wanted to do, to not send it to the grand jury at all, then they'd be flipping out about that. So, I mean, to me, Absolutely. it's just. It's presenting this bizarre, you know, one-sided view of the story. But I think, you know, for and me, the, course, the most pressing part is just the, the on-the-ground reporting. Here you send people to do reporting about what's 
actually going on there. And, and they, they and they won't it. tell you. Na Naomi, I got to go. But great, great column. And you're right on target. Naomi Schaefer Riley will speak to you again. Thank you. Folks, Thank the Mulsberg panel care. will return after the break. But first, when the USS Missouri was attacked by the Japanese during World War II, no one ever thought that same ship uh, would later play host to the uh, singing, or I'm sorry, the signing of the instrument of surrender by those very attackers. Let's now take a look back at the attack on the USS Missouri with this American moment. Christened on January 29, 1944, by the daughter of future President Harry S. Truman, the USS Missouri was our country's last great battleship and rapidly became the pride of the American Navy. On the 11th of April, 1945, she was attacked by a kamikaze pilot who crashed his aircraft into her starboard side, causing minor damage, which can still be seen to this day. The Missouri's commander, Captain William N. Callahan, ordered the pilot's body to be recovered so he could be buried at sea with full military honors. Serving with distinction throughout the Great War and beyond, it seemed only fitting when General of the Army Douglas MacArthur chose her as the site of the Empire of Japan's unconditional surrender. On the day of the signing, September 2nd, 1945, General MacArthur put little trust in his former adversary. So as a precaution, he ordered over a thousand Allied combat aircraft to fill the skies over Tokyo Bay as a warning to the Japanese. Should they be planning anything but complete and unconditional surrender. Retribution would be swift and complete. With her decks filled with sailors and soldiers alike, Supreme Allied Commander Douglas MacArthur began the ceremonies. He took his pen and handed it to General Jonathan Wainwright. Wainwright was touched. He had stayed on in the Philippines during the 1941 Japanese invasion survived the Bataan Death March, and spent four years in a Japanese POW camp. A new long peace between Japan and America had begun. Big Mo, as she was affectionately known, permanently dropped anchor in Pearl Harbor on January 29, 1999, and opened as a museum, forever commemorating the site where America's involvement in World War II began, and where it ended. For Newsmax TV, I'm Bill Curtis, and this is an American Moment.